Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the Wilder School Lunch and Learn series. My name is Susan Gooden, and I serve as Dean of the L. Douglas Wilder School of Government and Public Affairs here at Virginia Commonwealth University, and I'm delighted to welcome you to today's Lunch and Learn. Uh, we will learn a lot today from our featured keynote speaker. I always do every time I hear him talk. Uh, Bill Lighty, who is going to speak about the American Recovery Act funding and its implications for state and local government. Uh, we're also proud that Bill uh, serves as a faculty member here at the Wilder School. And we're also proud of many things that are going on at the Wilder School. And I wanted to share just a few of those uh, with you. So first, uh, we are very pleased to share with you that we are a top ranked program of public affairs in the country, ranking in the top 15% of all programs, and we are tied for number one uh, here in the Commonwealth of Virginia. Very proud of our students, our faculty, and our staff, and our alumni who have all made that possible. I'd also just like to share a few other quick tidbits with you to congratulate Governor Wilder, who was featured in the Emmy Award-winning WTVR election special in the category of politics and government, long form content uh, for his special on the Commonwealth's choice through WTVR Channel 6. Uh, so congratulations to Governor Wilder. Also, hopefully you had an opportunity to um, see our Plessy versus Ferguson symposium that we did with the Russell Sage Foundation. If you didn't, it has aired on C-SPAN 3 and is also available from cspan.org. Um, this special symposium examined the 125th anniversary of the historic US Supreme Court decision, Plessy versus Ferguson. The Wilder School was very proud to co-sponsor this event along with our partners at the Humphrey School at the University of Minnesota, as well as with the Haas Institute at the University of California, Berkeley. The graphic that you see in the right-hand corner uh, is the, of the cover of the Russell Sage Foundation Journal, and all of the articles in that journal are available uh, to download for free as well. And then finally, we'd like to congratulate our Assistant Dean of Student Success, uh, Shawana Isom Payne, for her award. She received the 2021 Outstanding Advising Advocate Award from Virginia Commonwealth University. We're very proud of Shawana and all the work that she's done uh, in advising our students and recognizing her excellence from the university. So congratulations, Shawana. And last but not least, I always encourage you to please support our students, our faculty, and the programs that we are providing to you. As you know, many of our students are facing significant hardships following the coronavirus and the pandemic, uh, which is of course ongoing. And any financial support that you can provide to our students is much appreciated, as well as to our faculty who are doing outstanding work in terms of their scholarship and their teaching and our signature programs, such as our uh, Wilder School Alumni Lunch and Learn. So with that, I will turn it over to our moderator for today, who is Linda Pierce. Linda is a colleague of ours who also serves as Associate Director of Performance Management Group. And uh, PMG, which I know many of you are familiar with, uh, is celebrating its 40th anniversary of doing education and training to many state and local leaders, including their sig signature Virginia Executive Institute or VEI. So Linda, I will turn it to you, over to you. Thank you, Dean Gooden. It's oh. It's a pleasure to be here today. Um, hello, everyone. As Dean Gooden said, I am Linda Pierce. I'm Associate Director of the Performance Management Group. And under the leadership of our director, James Burke, we do offer a variety of business consulting services in the public sector and also leadership and professional development, all the way from aspiring supervisors through the Virginia Executive Institute. But today, it is my pleasure to introduce our featured speaker, my friend and colleague, Bill Lighty. Uh, welcome, Bill. We're, it's, we're really happy to have you here today. Bill has a long history of public service within the Commonwealth of Virginia. He served as a Marine, and thank you for your service. And after that, he joined the ranks of leadership in uh, public sector of Virginia, rising through various roles and becoming the director of the Virginia Retirement System. From January 2002 through September of 2007, 
He was the chief of staff for then Governor Warner and Kane, respectively. And during that time, operating as chief operating officer of the Commonwealth, he instituted a statewide performance management system, which largely contributed to Virginia being named the best managed state in 2005 and 2007, respectively. Uh, currently, he serves as senior strategic advisor to the Dean and to the Wilder School, where he serves in various capacities. And I've had the pleasure of working with Bill on various consulting projects. He always brings a good sense of humor, a quick wit, and an ability to think strategically and synthesize information like none other, always with the intent of being the best stewards of Virginia's resources as possible. So today, Bill, you have some thoughts on the American Recovery Plan Act and how the state should look forward to planning for that and investing the funds. So we'd love to hear your thoughts. Thank you. Thank you, Linda, and thank you, uh, Dean Gooden. It's a pleasure to be with you all today for the Wilder School Lunch and Learn. I um, wanted to talk to you a little bit about the American Recovery Plan, American Rescue Plan. It goes by both names. Um, and uh, got a little bit of an agenda here for you. Um, next slide. I'm going to very briefly um, go over uh, a review of the packages, not very much detail at all, talk about the legislative intent, uh, the federal funding levels, and then talk about the Virginia specific allocations, talk about suggested guidance from a number of perspectives, what you can expect from oversight, and then we're gonna have ample time for Q and A. Um, so thank you. Uh, in terms of a disclaimer, for those of you who know me well, know I'm not perfect. Um, despite my reputation, that is. Um, the presentation does provide a lot of information uh, about uh, the Recovery Act funding programs. At a very high level, it's for discussion about the policy um, and is not intended as legal or financial guidance. I'm actually not a lawyer. Um, and much of this presentation did come from the Senate Finance and Appropriations Committee presentations on this subject uh, from a little over three or four weeks ago, which means of course that it really came from Secretary Aubrey Lane and the Department of Planning and Budget, uh, which was resynthesized then by Senate Finance. Next. Uh, not gonna spend any time on this other than to say, although we've heard about CARES Act and we've heard about PPP, um, and of course we've heard about ARPA, um, these are all names that are a little bit more well known than the six different programs that have actually been enacted already by Congress. Um, so we, we, you know, we, there's the interplay of each and every one of these acts uh, may or may not have some own internal conflicts. It's up to the U.S. Department of Treasury to iron out those conflicts with its interpretation. Next slide, please. Um, there are, despite any of these individual six programs, the intent, legislative intent, comes really down to four things. Restoration of government services that were lost due to reduced revenue uh, from COVID. Um, economic impact aid, uh, particularly for small households, small businesses, nonprofits and tourism and things like that. Uh, the third item is premium pay for essential workers and grants to their employers. And fourth is investment in water, sewer, and broadband infrastructure, which has really gotten a lot more play in the press than anything else. Of note, there are only two items that are expressly prohibited by the legislation, and that is that neither state nor local governments can use any of the money to reduce their existing taxes or delaying taxes. Um, or, and uh, specifically mentions that you cannot use the money to reduce your pension obligation. Next. So let's put this in perspective. Um, when you look at these six programs and you can look at them individually, I won't go into them, but the bottom line is, is that we're talking about $5.2 trillion in federal money that has been allocated out to the states, local governments and individuals uh, to try to offset the impact of the coronavirus on both our way of life as well as our economy. Next slide. In Virginia, 
we're going to receive 4.3 billion at the state level and another 2.9 billion at the local level. Uh, all of this money comes with very specific guidance through the uh, US Treasury Department uh, on how the state and local allocations can be spent. Uh, interestingly enough, and I will mention this briefly, but there's really kind of four buckets. There's the state, there's counties, there are cities, and Senator Warner and Senator King were able to get Virginia recognized in the federal legislation in that our cities are independent of our counties, which actually ended up with a double hit for many of our cities, um, such as the city of Richmond. And then there's a, a, another entity called um, non-entitlement localities. And this is basically towns and other governmental entities that are sub city or county level. Um, interestingly enough, in the, at the 2021 legislative session, the General Assembly reserved language in the bill, Appropriations Act, giving it express authority for the decision over the ARPA allocations, and I'm talking ARPA specifically there, uh, which meant that the governor could not allocate the money when it came to him, um, which resulted in the need for a special session. Now there is a caveat to that, which is that the governor recognizing that this money was supposed to be put to use very quickly, basically wrote the chairman of the money committees and said, hey, the law is pretty clear about these certain uses of the money. And in fact, it's so clear that it has to be used for these particular reasons that I'm going to go ahead and start allocating it and spending it unless you tell me in the meantime that you don't want me to do that. Um, so there was good discussion between the General Assembly and the governor's office about how to get the money moving uh, fairly quickly. At this point, all of the allocations have been made. I use the word allocation at a very high level. Uh, that means the money may have been allocated to the town of Crew, but that doesn't mean that Crew has already decided how to spend the money. So I've got to be careful with the word allocation there. Next slide, please. So um, given that state and local government is really quite frankly awash in money right now, I haven't even touched upon the fact that um, despite the fact that COVID was supposed to really have a huge impact on the economy, neither state or local governments really were impacted to the negative degree that people anticipated. In fact, there's actually huge surpluses running right now. State of Virginia has a $2.6 billion surplus. Uh, which is unprecedented in the modern times or even any time. Um, and so local governments are really struggling, quite frankly, with how do they spend all this money. The city of Richmond, for example, received $155 million in combined funds uh, allocated to it, which is 20% of its annual budget. I don't know many local governments that have a plan on the shelf for how they would spend 20% increase in the money that they have. So I've got some guidance here uh, of what state and local government ought to do. One is create a working group to reach a consensus of how the money should be allocated. You know, it would be very easy to turn to your budget office and say, give me your ideas. But if you do so, you're going to get a very narrow view of how that money might be spent. Uh, it might be better to create a group of cross-cutting working group of, of people that do that. I would say that most budget shops, unless you have an exceptional budget shop like we do here in Virginia, actually have very little knowledge about what the agencies do with the money that they give them. Um, so having the expertise of the agencies and the divisions that will actually be spending the money on a working group would be very important. Make sure your procurement professionals are ready and equipped. You're gonna be putting a huge amount of money out on the street in a very short period of time in addition to the regular procurement load that they've already got, uh, to the degree that you are slow, you are going to be at the whims of the contractor's capacity that is left over after they bid on all the other jobs. So you got to make sure that you do this in a timely manner. Um, and I think very important is designate an accountability officer to track the funds. Frame the story of how you want to tell your citizens how you're going to spend this money. Next slide, please. I'm suggesting eight um, ideas. Um, 
First and foremost, and this is pretty universal guidance from just about anybody dealing with this subject, is um, invest the money in one-time expenditures. Uh, don't do anything that's going to create an ongoing expenditure or co commitment. Uh, don't do any excessive hiring, for example. Uh, invest the money to assess where you stand with your capital and fixed assets. Everybody who has ever run an organization knows that Jack down in facilities has been telling you for years that you got to fix that boiler. Now's the time to do it uh, and use some innovation when you do the deferred maintenance request, uh, build in uh, energy savings, windows, controlled lighting, things like that. Uh, invest in parks and recreation. I got a little pushback actually from this uh, when I first suggested it. Uh, Treasury has subsequently come out with guidance, making it clear that parks and outdoor activities are, are, are fundable under this. Establish innovative partnerships to support the recovery of small businesses and restaurants. Don't think that you can do it all yourself or that you need to do it using government um, offices. There's plenty of nonprofits out there that can help you as well. Next slide, please. Invest in re-engineering your customer service interfaces. Not everything needs to be done face-to-face. -face. I think we've learned this uh, tremendously um, particularly in permits and inspections are way behind on getting caught up on things. Invest in distressed communities. This is the time to do those equity things to make every neighborhood in your community successful. Um, the American Recovery Plan has very strong incentive plans, uh, incentive language in it, to in invest in broadband and utility infrastructure, water and sewer. These are all the lifeblood of economic development. Use that money wisely. Uh, invest in planning and regional activities. Uh, any money spent on planning is never wasted, and your citizens enjoy you thinking regionally. Next. That's my guidance. Now, there are a number of organizations out there um, that are monitoring this from a national perspective. I've given you some resources here the National Governors Association, the Inner City County Managers Association, the National Association of Counties, the Conference on Mayors, and the National Conference of State Legislatures. Here in Virginia, the Virginia Municipal League has an excellent website and is, is really staying on top of all of the guidance from the feds on uh, how to spend this money. Next slide, please. Um, you know, there's, Nothing worse, and I've actually been there in my career, but there's nothing worse than having to tell your governing board that, oh, by the way, that $28 million that the feds gave us five years ago, well, guess what? They won it back because we didn't spend it properly. So uh, oversight is a very important component of this. In the CARES funding bill, uh, the Lair's language creating a pandemic response accountability committee, which is a subcommittee of the Inspectors General Association of the United States. Um, and their mission is to uh, promote transparency and support independent oversight of funds and also provide oversight of those funds uh, in the coronavirus response. I've put their website here because there's a great deal of information there about how you should go about reporting and what kind of reporting might be necessary uh, for you uh, to Keep in mind as you spend this money. Next slide, please. With that, I, this is my allocated 20 minutes and I will now move on and Linda, our wonderful moderator will give me some questions. And here's the deal. If you don't ask any questions, I will ask myself questions that I'm very good at answering. <laughs> Thank you, Bill, and thank you so much uh, for that overview of the American Recovery Plan Act. Um, you mentioned that the money is allocated 4.3 to the state and another 2.9 to the localities, which include cities, towns, counties, things like that. How would you suggest that these separate governing entities work together to create synergy on the planning and investment of funding instead of disparate acts. And please, we do encourage everyone to put any of your questions in the Q&A or the chat. Well, 
Linda, I am a huge fan in Virginia of the, pub, of the planning district commission set up in Virginia. They are very effective. They are very collaborative. And um, if I wanted to talk regionally about spending my money, I would be turning to my planning district commission. In many cases, those planning district commissions align with our health department uh, alignments and other governmental alignments that we have in Virginia. But I would be looking for the planning district commissions especially with water resource planning. They do so much of that already. Um, and so, you know, it's, it's, it's no surprise to us that, that live in Richmond that we are very concerned about Lynchburg fixing its sewer problems because that's our river too, you know? So yes, that kind of discussion should take place, needs to take place and should be part of whatever in a working group that you might create to oversee the, the allocation of the funding. Thank you, Bill. Love the idea of, of working with is what is already established and in place to do that. Um, another question is the funds have to be spent by the end of the fiscal year 2024, with only one of two governor elections in the United States being held in Virginia this year. Uh, how, would, how should we plan for the transition from one administration to the other? Well, you know, um, transitions are always tricky. Um, it's, you know, in Virginia in particular, because the outgoing governor, in this case, Governor Northern, will present one of his two big budgets that he gets to put together and give it to a governor that has not seen it and may or may not agree with it. So there are always fairly significant swings in the budgetary allocations when you have a new governor come in. <coughs> However, because in this case, the General Assembly has reserve the right for so many of these allocations, you're going to see a fairly collaborative process to get those allocations established to begin with. And given the pretty strong parameters that already exist, there may or may not be that much change when a new governor comes in. Great, thank you. And thank you for the questions. Please continue to put them into the chat or the Q&A. We do have a question about um, to what extent could the funds be allocated to infrastructure for social services? For example, increasing low income housing options or homes for the homeless. And if that infrastructure is built, how can the community step up to provide ongoing assistance? Oh, wonderful question. Um, you know, one of the great tragedies of America is how badly um, low income and moderate income housing has perverted our racial picture of what the world looks like in, in Virginia as well as the world. Um, I am a, I would be, when I talked in about my guidance about addressing the inequities among our communities, housing was what I specifically had in mind. Uh, there is a huge opportunity now for affordable housing. Um, quite frankly, if you haven't been driving to malls lately that are completely empty and devoid of anything, you can see huge opportunities for low and moderate um, apartments in some of these places. In fact, most mall operators have learned that if they don't have a substantial um, apartment complex associated with their mall, they're not going to succeed. You can look at Regency Square. You can look at the, uh, the West Shore Pump Town Center. All those places rely now very, very heavily on housing. The problem is that a developer's idea of affordable housing and a renter's idea of affordable housing are very, very different things. Huh. And, you know, the, the housing people are going to, the, the developers are going to want to get premium dollars. Um, and so it, it's very, very difficult. I, I have an office in Scott's Edition. They have put a little over 3,500 apartments in there. And that's before this latest round. Um, so that's becoming a huge issue as well. So uh, I don't think I've addressed your question very well, but that's the best I can do at this point. <laughs> no, you did, you did a great job. Uh, we also have a question, a couple of questions regarding the working group that you suggested. Um, one of them is, could you give an example of a, a recent time when a working group such as you suggested was pulled together uh, how it went and what were some of the, the factors for success. And then a follow-up question for that was, are there opportunities at VCU for us to perhaps spearhead 
or facilitate that type of a working group? Um, yes, I mean, I would say number one, the number one criteria you should be looking at in a working group is diversity of, of race and social factors. That doesn't often happen in a budget office um, and, and it needs to happen. Uh, the diversity of thought, for example, uh, Linda, you know, when I first posed the question about using some of the money for parks and recreation, the budget people immediately called me and said, hey, you were the topic of our meeting this week. You can't do that. That's not allowable. And, and I'm like, well, wait a minute. Then you're not thinking creatively enough because there's definitely a way to deal with the deferred maintenance in parks. There's definitely a way to create low income employment programs to clean your parks up. There's other ways of doing it. And you're not gonna get that if you're getting people on your working group that are focused on just reading the treasury guidance. Now, on the other hand, Linda, I have never admired innovation in my finance director. I don't want, <laughs> I don't want my finance director to be creative. I want my finance director to be focused on accountability and making sure the money is spent wisely. But that doesn't mean the finance director can't be paired with people that are a little bit more creative and can come up with some ideas about how to use the money a little more creativity, uh, creatively. Um, you know, broadband is probably a huge example of that. Um, we are getting ready to plow so much money into broadband. We have so little capacity in the industry to fulfill that promise. And that's one thing because most technical people, when you talk about the last mile of broadband and access for everybody, forget that access to broadband has two components. One is actual linkage to the broadband and the other one is a linkage to being able to pay for the broadband. And so we are getting ready to put a lot of broadband down to people that can't really afford it. And so you're gonna to have to have people that have the diversity, inclusion and equity component uh, in their thinking to help you think through those kind of things. Right, thank you, Bill. There's quite a few questions about um, the working group. And as you say, the diversity of the working group and, and how that affects the decision for allocations. Uh, one of the questions was, do you envision the use of participatory budgeting whereas the citizens decide on the allocation or do you envision your working group to be strictly uh, an internal government advisory group? Oh gosh. <laughs> That's a tough one. <laughs> really trying to trip me up here. Um, <laughs> yeah. I would say, uh, you know, I think a full, I mean, having, there are a number of programs out there that allow citizens to participate in budget making. Um, but there are so many technicalities as well. I would much rather favor a citizen representative on the budget making committee than a full blown citizen participation in the budget. Great, right, thank you. There's also a question. Uh, we, you know, the our mental health and the Commonwealth and our facilities have been in the paper quite a bit lately. Uh, do you have specific ideas about these monies can go to uh, to improve, you know, to improve the service to the clients in the mental health area, including training and education for our mental health um, providers? Well, Linda, it really, really does come down to you're asking. Um, a lot of people generally in low, low, low weight um, categories to put the danger of their own risk, their own life, what the patients themselves may do. And, you know, it's kind of interesting because I've seen a lot of play in the press about, you know, the, the first rounds of the, the COVID response money providing benefits to people being hired. And yes, that is a factor. But you know, when you see things like, you know, 30 of the 32 employees at the local parties quitting on the same day, that's got nothing because they're not going to be eligible for benefits. That's got nothing to do with um, with them thinking they're going to get more benefits by not working. It has to do with working conditions. It has to do with treatment of the uh, people that are in those positions. I don't think that the HR profession has been 
more necessary than it is today uh, in helping employers understand the value of every employee uh, and getting them to work. When you've got an unemployment rate of 4.5%, whatever it is announced this week, you're already close to what economists would call full employment to begin with. Um, so if there's a bright spot in the coronavirus, it's that employers now recognize as a top priority that the health, safety, and welfare of their employees is probably ranked number one and their service level is probably ranked number two because they're not going to get number two if they don't get number one. So mm -hmm. I, I think that there has been, <coughs> and I saw this when working with Governor Warner, we had to talk to a number of plants that shut down in Martinsville. And you had the employees there that were just unwilling to tra retrain. They just like, wait a minute, I, I deserve this job. I want this job. Um, you can't just take my job away from me. Uh, if there's an advantage to what's happened with the pandemic it is that it's put everybody on pause and made them reflect about their career path and their career choices. And many of them now are realizing they can make a different choice. And as a consequence, those areas uh, of employment that have already traditionally been high turnover are gonna suffer even higher turnover as people begin making different life choices. So uh, the answer is short term, more money, longer term is more respect for the worker. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because there definitely, you know, you've heard that there is a perception of some, um, you know, some employees in some of the industry sectors, such as hospitality, restaurant business, um, are not returning because of because of the wage. And I, you were buffering in and out there a little bit, Bill. But I, I think what you were saying is that this is an opportunity to really invest in our workers to show them the value that they bring to any organization, and to, um, you know, to to reward them accordingly for that. So thank you. Uh, we do have another question sticking on this kind of mental health, but uh, there is a question that says that the American Rescue Plan and other stimulus temporarily enhanced Medicaid and other subsidies for health insurance. How do you anticipate that we may be able to continue to use these funds to address other health care needs beyond just some mental health? Well, I mean, you know, it was interesting. I was talking to um, a couple of the delegates that are on the Health, Welfare and Institutions Committee yesterday. And that's exactly one of the things that they're going to be talking about when they come to town on August 2nd is to what degree do we need to expand this without overduly creating a long term commitment for funding. Um, because this money goes away after three years. So every program you start now, you better have an exit strategy <coughs> or a funding source for it after three years comes up. Uh, and that's not going to be an easy task. You know, Linda, this is such a complex subject because it interplays with Virginia's tax policy and the federal tax policy as well. Uh, a lot of the surplus that we're being seeing right now comes from, for example, last month, a 32% in internet sales taxation, uh, which didn't exist before, um, gosh, the last time we had to deal with this. Uh, and that's a relatively new thing. That's money we're capturing that was never captured before that localities are seeing as a surplus. Localities are seeing surpluses from the value of their property taxes that they're getting because of the increase in housing prices. Um, mm -hmm. So um, you're, you're talking about a number of very temporary fiscal conditions that could go away in a heartbeat. Um, in Virginia, we had about 300,000 tax filers that chose married filing jointly uh, because the federal, they. In Virginia, if you choose the federal married filing jointly, you have to choose the state filing jointly. Well, the federal tax policy under the tra Trump tax cuts increased the standard deduction to such a high level that very, very few people <coughs> choose to itemize anymore when they take the standard deduction. So we went from having about 300,000 married filing jointly filers to over 800 which meant they paid a lot more in state taxes, but less, less in federal taxes. That's going to go away in 2024 when the Trump tax cuts expire, uh, unless you know those are extended. I guess what I'm saying here, and I don't mean to belabor the intricacies of everything that's going on from a fiscal situation, but 
but it needs belabored. Uh, somebody needs to belabor it is what I'm saying. Somebody needs to sit down and say, wow, you know, there's an awful lot of moving pieces here and we're focusing on one right now, which is all this money coming to us. There are a whole lot of other aspects of what's going on with the economy and tax policy that need to be explored in conjunction with that. So long story short is, I admire those who want to do something more about, me about health, mental health in particular. Uh, the, the long story is they need to do it in a way that creates a long-term plan. Linda, we did some work, my little consulting firm did some work for some local governments in the south side of Virginia. And to capsulize our, our conversations with them, it came down to this. Uh, we didn't get hurt too bad, Mr. Lighty, but nothing addresses the underlying health issues, which is the real driver of inequity in our community. And so we've got to do something in this health area. And, you know, it's just, it's just something health policy that VCU is such, in such a premier place to address. I hope that something is done about it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, our, our ability to, to help affect policy would be a wonderful addition to this conversation. And Bill mentioned his little consulting firm, which is not so little, Decide Smart is, is a wonderful organization that helps many throughout the Commonwealth. We do have quite a few questions, Bill, that have to do with the accountability group uh, that, that you mentioned. And um, there were some thoughts that, that maybe you said something that the worst thing that could happen would be four or five years, you'd have to give the money back or you know, what are the criteria for spending it and how do we have that type of an oversight? And is there any, I'm combining a few questions here, but is there an ROI, a return on investment calculation uh, at all required as part of the planning of the allocation of funds. So how do we get our arms around this whole accountability aspect so that we are sure that we're spending the funds in, not on a reoccurring basis so that in you know three, four years when the financial environment changes, we don't have obligations that we cannot support? You know, uh, Linda, uh, and I'll say this and probably get in trouble, but um, <laughs> yeah, I'm retired, so, um, you know, the federal government, nine times out of ten, has no idea what it's doing. Um, <laughs> Bill, tell us your tell us your real opinion on that one. <laughs> the federal government's definition of a successful program is how fast you spend the money. <clears throat> and look at the triggers in this one. You know, it had to be allocated within 60, 120 days. It has to be spent within three years. They didn't spend much time in Congress debating performance measures. OK, so that's not to say that if you spend the money quickly, you're probably going to be OK. You're not. you got to be spending the money in a way that's in compliance with the intent of the legislation. And so having your own accountability group that studies what's going on at the national level and within the guidance that is coming out from the state is going to be your best measure, which is why I placed one of three major emphases on creating that accountability meister, someone that's going to be tracking this information. Mm -hmm. so. That would be wonderful. And I, I, don't, I don't mean to be overly mean to my federal counterparts. I, in fact, just before this call got off the phone with Senator Warner, I didn't say that to him. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> but uh, in, in reality, um, they, they just don't, when they allocate this money, they just don't have the concepts of what a on the ground social worker has to deal with. I mean, just think about what's happened to the foster care system in the midst of all this. No one was taking anybody from the outside. Um, and so there, there's all that going on. There, there is, however, of course, no specific allocation to foster care that I've come across in all of this. Um, but yet it's an, an area that needs to be taken care of. I'm wandering now, I'm sorry. Let me refocus me. No, no, that's okay. Um, we, we do have some questions about our various legislators and, and I will add even lobbyists to that, um, to that question if you don't mind, Mike. Are they working individually to try to figure out how to use the money for their own pet projects? And then kind of on that too, should we, should we as public sector leaders have some type of a campaign or some type of a voice in trying to direct how these um, funds might be considered for investment and allocation? Well, I would say, uh, Linda, 
that the strongest voice that needs to be heard is use this as an opportunity to address inequity in our society uh, from a policy perspective. <clears throat> be creative about how you do that. I mean, look at all of the money that's coming in to the Richmond area, for example, for transportation. Yet 84% of it was allocated to roads. When mass transit and other ride sharing programs really, really need to have more attention than what they're getting. Uh, I don't want to be critical of Plan RVA, but uh, man, and again, some of that is driven, Linda, by the fact that there wasn't a long term plan for funding mass transit, and therefore there was no hope of spending it quickly. And since one of the criteria is spend it quickly, what are you going to do? You're going to put it on roads. Uh, so, um, as public administrators, I would still just champion the fact that we need to be more creative about inclusivity, um, equity, and diversity in our thought about how to spend this money. I to totally agree with you, Bill. And we have a follow-up question about that. And somebody's wondering, should there be a required, some type of a requirement of an equity analysis as part of the decision-making um, for the allocate, allocation and investment of these funding. Have, have you ever heard of anything like that? And, and would you suggest that as part of the accountability function? The closest I have seen to that, Linda, is that the federal government housing urban development is now requiring fairly detailed um, low and middle income housing analyses in every community before they get any federal money. Um, I do know for a fact that the um, Depart U.S. Department of Transportation is now requiring everybody receiving federal funding for mass transit to do a strategic plan. That's an opportunity to inject diversity, inclusion, and equity, um, but not specifically mentioning that. But, you know, it doesn't take a lot of analysis in a community to know where the inequity is. Mm -hmm. uh, we, we know. The question is whether we're willing to address it or not. Mm -hmm. And personally, I think that the Wilder School has a wonderful opportunity to prepare to provide some guidance in that area as we've been doing a lot of um, equity work and policy analysis around that. Specifically, I can say PMG has worked with the Department of Health to analyze their policies for equity and it's, it was very insightful. I'd like to turn our attention a little bit to the education system bill. Uh, it has been such a challenging year for K through 12 and for higher education, you know, trying to pivot, which they've done wonderfully for and open and close and go back and forth. Do you have any specific recommendations uh, for investment in K-12 and then also in, in higher education to help them kind of resume back into whatever the new status quo is? Well, you know, I am not sure I would encourage him to resume back to the status quo. Mm -hmm. I, I honestly believe <clears throat> that, that online education has a much larger place in our society than ever before. However, there are too many people that think a Zoom meeting is online education, and that's not online education. Online education involves the establishment of teams that help the student understand uh, how to stay current and do the things they need to do. Um, let me put it differently. There is a lot of money going into both K-12 and higher ed. I have been heartened to see that much larger allocation went to HBCUs uh, than to anyone else. Um, but there is a built-in problem with our funding of higher ed, which is that in the state of Virginia, and I hate to say it this way, but in the state of Virginia, higher ed is always considered to be an area where you can cut because they can make it up on tuition. And not everyone can make it up on tuition. You know, it does have a dramatic impact on our ability to extend beyond the, um, the multi generational college degree family to first generational degree families uh, when you do that kind of thing. So um, I would encourage looking at that formula and how we go about doing that um, because it, it, is, it is a truism that when you look at the really big drivers 
in the budget of where we spend our money, higher ed is one of them and higher ed one is considered discretionary. Uh, our employers don't think that, so that's important. Yeah. Upon that line, I believe I read uh, this week or last week in the paper that some of the HBCUs are using some of their funding for loan forgiveness for their students. Do you have thoughts about that? Well, yes and no. I mean, I have thoughts about it. Um, <laughs> of course you do. <laughs> but if you read carefully, what you found is that the HBCUs are forgiving any debtness that the student owes to them. They're not forgiving any debtness, indebtedness owed to other entities. So if I came to Virginia State and I took a federal student loan, I still owe it. Okay, even if I go into bankruptcy, I still owe it. But if I borrowed through a program that was run by uh, Virginia State, then that was forgiven. Or if I hadn't paid my tuition and I was back, backed up, then I got it forgiven. So that, that's a nice program, but it needs to go further. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, that is quite, quite the distinction. Are you aware, Bill, of how some other states are handling you know, the planning for and the allocation of these monies? You're, you're always out there looking for how others are doing it. And um, so any ideas on states that we could look at and gain some good tips from? Oh, wow. Um, well, in the list, resources that I provided you from the National Governors Association. There is a NASBO, National Association of State Budget Officers link, to an overview mm -hmm. of what every state is doing. <coughs> I didn't include it, um, but there is also a group online called Route 50. Route 50 being the road that goes from New Jersey to California, uh, less famous than Route 66. Uh, but uh, it, it, it's a link to all the states and local governments that it runs, it runs across the United States. And it has a weekly update on how people are spending their money. So that would be another good resource. Am I frozen? Linda? So I'm, I'm not frozen, but Linda is, huh? It looks like Linda is frozen. Let me uh, jump in here, Bill, and ask a, a quick question regarding, um, we talked about other states, but I know we have several folks who are also part of other national associations like John Kaminsky is on from the Center of Accountability and Performance. We've got some Napa fellows and folks from ASPA. How do you think um, professional associations and professional organizations in the public service space might be uh, helpful to this work? You know, I would think, um, Dean Gooden, I would think that quite frankly, uh, working with the uh, accountability group that's been created by the CARES Act to help establish some performance reporting standards and formats that uh, local governments could use would be fantastic. Uh, a, a great, great innovation would be to provide specific guidance on what to expect when reporting stuff. Great. And we have another question. Um, uh, one of our participants is asking, should suggestions for use of Richmond City's money be sent to city council or to the mayor? Um, both. I would think, I would think you'd want to do both. Um, at least put it this way. I've done both. <laughs> so <laughs> I, I've told both what I want them to do the mind, but, um, yeah, I, I would think that, uh, doing both would be great. And I think doing both in a concerted effort, um, i.e. if other like-minded people all believe that there's you know, something needs to be done more on mental health that you get together as a group and you go uh, would be very, very helpful. Uh, 
I have not seen much about them. I do know because I've got former students that are in the budget office. I have heard back from them privately about some of the discussions that have been taking place, uh, but I've not formally done it. As you know, uh, Virginia's uh, or Richmond's budget structure is that the mayor proposes and the council disposes. So uh, you're going to have both, but you also have to keep in mind as with all executive budgets, 90, 95% of what is proposed usually gets enacted. So you need to get contact with the, with the mayor's office as well as with uh, your council person. Great. And if you could look into your crystal ball uh, for a moment, the special session will be convening in a, a few weeks. How smooth or how challenging do you think that that, that will go? Because that's where a lot of those decisions will be made. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> Well, it's pretty clear that the, once again, the big committee that will be doing the yeoman's work uh, when they come back in in August is going to be the budget committees. Um, but I, I honestly believe, you know, that uh, the governor's office and particularly the budget office um, have a really good sense of what's tolerable in the General Assembly and what they'll accept and what they'll support. So I don't see it as being a very big issue between the governor and the General Assembly. I think that uh, you've already seen the governor's allocated some 550 million to COVID relief for small businesses and to business community and tourism. Um, I expect to see, because I've been pushing it for so long, I'm expecting to see a very sizable chunk of money to go into parks and outdoor recreation of what's being proposed as well. Um, mental health cannot be ignored. Um, so you're going to see probably some, some language that's going to talk about um, employment bonuses and, and uh, pay raises for folks in critically short areas such as mental health. And we've got to be careful because the health districts are not very far behind mental health in starting to experience shortages. So that'll be the next big wave. Great. Well, we're almost at the end of, uh, almost at the top of the hour. So Bill, any final thoughts uh, that you'd like to share with our audience? Uh, no, it's been a pleasure to be with you today. Um, <clears throat> with unprecedented um, challenges comes unprecedented opportunity and the, uh, the, the bevy of funds coming at us from the federal government is, is a great opportunity for us to do some things that we've not been done before. If we think about it, and we think about it in the long term, and we don't just start rushing out and spending the money. Well, well said, Bill. Uh, I know that you've given a lot for all of us to think about. Your guidelines and your principles that you have put forth are, are very cogent, very responsible. But as you mentioned, also underscore the unprecedented opportunity that, that we have, uh, particularly in terms of one-time funding and some great work that we can do in improving um, public service for all the citizens and residents. So we look forward to more to come. Thank you so much for serving as this month's key, keynote featured speaker for our signature alumni lunch and learn series. I also would like to thank uh, Linda I know that she um, had some technical difficulties, but thank you, Linda, for your exceptional job in moderating here. And I'll turn it back over to Paula Otto to close us out. Thank you, Dean Gooden. And again, thank you so much to Bill and to Linda and to the many people who joined us for this important discussion this afternoon. We appreciate all of our attendees. We'd also ask that you save the date for the next Wilder School Lunch and Learn session, which will be Wednesday, September 22nd, also at noon. More information about the focus of that event will be shared soon. We also hope that you will all complete the survey about today's session in the post-event email. Several of you have asked about Bill Lighty's slides and those will be included in that post-event email. We also will give you an opportunity to share your ideas for future topics for upcoming Lunch and Learn events. A recording of today's session is going to be available as well 
on the Wilder School YouTube site. Uh, you'll also get that link in the follow-up email. On behalf of the Wilder School, we thank you for attending and joining us today. We look forward to seeing you at future sessions, and we hope that all of you have a great rest of your day.